When looking at origins, the first point to note is that Exodus chapter 20 says that God made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. In Genesis chapter 1, we read the order in which he created all the creatures. Anyone believing this has no need of an explanation of how life appeared on earth. Anyone who does not believe in a creator has to believe that life created itself. Life must have evolved, and since we never see it actually happening, it must be a very slow process and probably difficult to observe. Evolution is a very old idea. An ancient Greek philosopher Anaximander speculated about a life starting in water and gradually developing into higher life forms. Others, including Aristotle, concluded that this is a foolish idea, since all life forms are so complex they must have been designed. The idea of design pointing inevitably to a designer was put forward very convincingly by William Paley, and for a long time those who wanted to deny a creator had to answer to his arguments from design, something obviously designed a watch, for example, must have a designer. But some people did put forward theories of evolution anyway. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck speculated that behaviour could lead to change. The best known example is the idea that an antelope-like creature continually stretched its neck to reach higher leaves on trees and after several generations, the long-necked giraffe resulted. But such behaviour does not lead to evolution. There are tribes in Africa where it's thought that women look beautiful with long necks. For generations, women have been stretching their necks with neck-stretching rings, adding new ones as their necks get longer over the years. But their children are always born with normal necks, and if girls want long necks, they have to put on the stretching rings from a young age. There was a similar situation in China, where for centuries small feet were considered beautiful for women. From childhood, girls' feet were tightly bound to stop them growing, but girls were always born with normal-sized feet. The Chinese recently outlawed foot binding since it's cruel and damages girls' feet for life. Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, had an idea quite similar to Lamarck's, but he didn't convince many people. Not surprising. His mechanism was a failure like Lamarck's. Charles Darwin put forward another idea. He had a little blob of protoplasm forming in some warm little pond from simple chemicals which came together by chance. This blob of protoplasm then evolved into all the life forms we have today. The difference between Darwin and his predecessors was that he had a plausible mechanism. That mechanism, called natural selection, appears to have been partly due to a biologist called Alfred Wallace. Their mechanism depended on a guess about genetics. The guess was that genes must be something like a genetic paint. Each parent has a little pot of this genetic material, and at reproduction, the pot from the mother gets mixed with the pot from the father. There should be an infinite number of ways of making uh, genetic patterns with these genetic colours. Some would be more fit for purpose than others. The most fit for purpose would survive and reproduce. The unfit for purpose would die out. This infinite genetic flexibility would lead to gradually more and more fit for purpose offspring and the evolution of better and better creatures. With a plausible mechanism to drive evolution, everyone who wanted to be free from the idea of a creator could come against Paley's argument for design, 
with an argument from natural selection. As Richard Dawkins wrote in The Blind Watchmaker, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. But paint pot genetics was shown to be wrong. When Gregor Mendel's experiments with plants proved that genes are discrete units, they can only be recombined at reproduction, not mixed together. This means only limited variation is possible by recombination. This kind of variability is very well known. Plant and animal breeders have been taking advantage of it for centuries. At first, Mendel's experiments were ignored, probably because people didn't want to know. But eventually it became clear that Darwin was just plain wrong. And three influential biologists, Theodosius Dobzhansky from Russia, Ernst Mayer from Germany and Julian Huxley from England came together in America to look for a theory of evolution with a more plausible mechanism. They hit on the idea of genes being altered by mutations, accidental changes to genes which allowed them to be different from their parents' genes. This allowed them to get back to the possibility of almost infinite variability. They realised that the chance of a mutation causing damage would be very high, and the chance of an accidental mutation leading to improvement would be very low. But they believed that the bad mutations would quickly die out, and good mutations would be so successful that they would take over the whole population. Their idea is known as the modern synthesis, or neo-Darwinism, meaning new Darwinism. It's the story which most people call the theory of evolution. It's not a scientific theory. It has never met the criteria of the scientific method. As far as real science is concerned, it is a hypothesis. The problem here is not that people have not done crucial experiments to test neo-Darwinism. They have, but they just never found any results which agree with it. Dobzhansky, for example, did experiments on fruit flies for many years. Fruit flies reproduce in about one week. So in 30 years, about 1,500 generations can be observed, and that should be enough to see some evolution. After 30 years, they had observed many mutations. Many mutants had damaged wings, damaged legs, legs or wings in the wrong place, all sorts of genetic damage, but not one improvement. And the only trace they found changed in the undamaged fruit flies was a slight difference in behaviour just before mating. They were all 100% fruit flies of the species they started the experiment with. They could all interbreed. They all looked about the same. This doesn't sound as if it's a great success story for evolution. Well, next time we'll look at some of the evolution stories which I learned at university and which are now being taught in our schools from about Grade 7. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.